This is Duke University. So it's uh, my great pleasure to welcome you all here on behalf of Duke University to our panel, which um, our special roundtable, which we're calling Collaboration or Co-optation, the relationship between indigenous medicine and biomedical paradigms in the 21st century. We have quite a distinguished guest of panelists as well, who will be discussing some of their experiences and the issues relating to intercultural medicine. And also we'll have some demonstrations as well as we see how the global and the local tend to come together. Uh, bien, bien, bienvenidos a todos. Es mi gran placer que ustedes estén aquí con nosotros para esta conferencia. Tenemos unos, unos um, presentantes uh, gracias, um, muy distinguidos y el tema de hoy o la cuestión es sobre la medicina inter intercultural y cómo es que si la medicina intercultural es una colaboración o una cooptación, vamos a ver, um, de la medicina indígena y la medicina um, Bio, biomédica o la medicina del oeste, de, decimos nosotros. En la, en la medicina intercultural, en la col colaboración, hay muchos, ¿cómo como, como, como lo, lo digo? O sea, hay, hay, hay muchas oportunidades, hay éxitos y hay desafíos a la vez. Y... Nuestros huéspedes van a hablar sobre estos. Así que primero es mi placer introducir a ustedes el doctor Walter Alvarez Quispe. Señor. Ah, en primer lugar, yo quería agradecer ¿no? la, a la universidad por esta invitación. Ya mi amigo también y le queríamos agradecer. Estamos contentos, estamos contentos de, de hablar sobre salud, pero salud en forma holística, eso es lo que está haciéndose. La salud más que todo preventivo y curativo. Yeah, I'm very happy of being here and thank you for the invitation. Uh, it's very important this opportunity to speak about a holistic perspective in medicine, uh, a, a perspective that uh, in, uh, involve us all. Uh, como por ejemplo, la salud, en primer lugar, el hombre tiene que cuidarse, no, no enfermarse, ¿no? prevenir, eso es lo fundamental. Tiene que evitar las enfermedades para cuidar los animales, las plantas y la madre tierra, que son alimento y medicina al mismo tiempo. The first Están thing... desapareciendo algunos, cuando desaparezcan no sé qué va a pasar. Ok, the first thing is that... A medicine has to have a dimension of prevention, uh, the prevention of illness. And the prevention of illness is connected to our relationship with the environment, with plants and animals. We are seeing uh, the destruction, systemic destruction of uh, plants and animals, and we don't know what is going to happen if they are gone. Uh, si no hay plantas, si no hay animales, si la madre tierra está también mal, nosotros vamos a estar también mal. If there is not plants and animals, and uh, the mother earth is in bad shape, what is going to happen with us? Eso es nuestro alimento, nuestra medicina. Entonces, pues, la cosa anda mal y va a andar mal. Then, uh, nature is our, uh, nurtures us, Uh, and feed us, uh, without it, uh, things are not going well. Como por ejemplo, yo represento una de las culturas más antiguas de América, o sea que el Coquina, eso queda con por ejemplo, Tiahuanaco y los Callahuayas, ¿no? Que habían clasificado todos los animales y plantas de la madre tierra, era medicina y alimento. I do represent one of the oldest peoples uh, in the Americas, uh, coming from Tiahuanaco in Bolivia, the Cayahualas. Uh, they 
in their time classified plants and animals uh, for seeing uh, uh, medical uses uh, from them. Como por ejemplo un poco hablando de de Bolivia, pasando otro tema. En Bolivia hay 36 idiomas, pero la puquina o machacuye o callaoya es la más antigua, después que quechua y la aymara. Yo do guaraní, esos son los más este no los que más se escriben. Hay 36 que se escriben, que se hablan, pero estos tres, cuatro, el español más, que es un idioma traído, pues, lo que más se habla en el país del español. Just to give you an example, in, in Bolivia we have uh, up to the 36 different languages spoken. Uh, the uh, most uh, uh, prevalent are Aymara, Quechua, and Pukina, uh, the Cayahuala, that actually is, precedes them all. Of course, the Spanish came after it was brought, uh, but uh, that speaks about the diversity that we have in Bolivia. Como por ejemplo, hoy estoy, ¿no? Yo soy médico, académico de la Universidad de Ginecólogos, soy cirujano, soy oncólogo, pero hoy estoy también como callaoya del linaje de este niño. Pues, y aprendí de la otra medicina, esta ropa que estoy llevando es de trabajo importante y de ceremonias de oraciones que hay que hacer con esta ropa, mire el aguayo, el, el capacho que se lleva medicamentos, este poncho que es el arco iris, o sea que la bandera, lo que nos da la madre tierra cuando vemos en el cielo, cuando llueve, ¿no? el arco iris. I am a medical doctor by training, a surgeon, a practitioner, surgeon and oncologist. Uh, actually, he was uh, trained in Cuba in the 1960s, the first generation of Cuban medical doctors trained uh, during the Cuban Revolution. That's my uh, <laughs> note here, sorry. Uh, but here I am as a Cayahuala doctor uh, by tradition, by heritage. And I'm dressed here as a Cayahuala. I'm using uh, the uh, particular distinctive Cayahuala uh, uh, dress uh, for a doctor. And if you see, it's full of colors. It's like the rainbow. Uh, rainbow signifies nature and the power of nature. Como por ejemplo, el Callaoya, ¿qué es Callaoya? Para mí son los primeros científicos de este continente. Han investigado casi como investigaban. El Callaoya llegaba a un pueblo, en ese pueblo ya estaba curando. El Callaoya con su conocimiento aportaba el conocimiento. Intercambio de conocimientos, troques de conocimientos. Era la forma de investigar. Aprendía y enseñaba. O sea que la complementar, si complementar con el Callaway, con el Callaway del pueblo, era la forma de hacer ciencia en el pasado. The Callawala were the first scientists in the continent. Uh, they learned by uh, trade. Uh, they uh, actually were nomad people uh, going to different towns, learning and uh, uh, also sharing uh, their knowledge uh, through time. Por ejemplo, yo empecé a, a hacer callaoya de los tres años, conociendo las plantas, los animales, la madre tierra. ¿no? ¿Cómo aprovecho? Porque nos ayudan a diagnosticar, nos ayudan a alimentar, nos ayudan a prevenir y cuidar. ¿no? Entonces, eso es los primeros años de mi madre. Cómo ser buen padre y cómo ser, este, ¿no? tener buena familia, cómo ayudar a mi pareja, mujer en el parto, en toda la vida, para ir bien, para eso pues cuando ya llega a cierta edad, pues esto no, los padres y madres ayudan al este no al hijo a que sea feliz sin ayuda no puede ser. A Cayawala uh, starts from a very young age. I started uh, to be trained uh, when I was three years old by my mother, just to learn uh, the surroundings, the plants, the animals. Uh, my father also uh, was teaching us uh, how to be a good father. Uh, because medicine starts with balance, harmony, harmony in the family, uh, and th that's part of the training. Uh, uh, medicine uh, is part of life. Entonces, eso eh, de, de hasta 12 años, pues, de la madre es el que uno aprende. ¿Cómo se recogen las plantas? Porque las plantas, por la mañana, mediodía y la noche, tienen distintas propiedades. El sol campo, eso hay que saberlo, ¿no? Los animales también, cómo hay que utilizar a diagnosticar y para curar todo eso, enseñaba la madre. Lo básico también, ¿no? cuando 
era niño hasta los 12 años, la madre se que curaba cuando se enferma el niño de diarrea, infección respiratoria, más que todo prevenir, evitar, solamente con la alimentación se puede prevenir, hay alimentos que estiman la cabecita, que deprimen y también que hacen soñar también, ¿no? así hay alimentos. Ok, actually es the mother who is the first trainer in this process, the mother who uh, takes care of children is the one who is uh, also teaching uh, Akayawala to be Akayawala, uh, how to treat the plants uh, depending the, the season or the time of the day, if it's day or night or evening or dawn, they have, uh, uh, the plants have uh, characteristic, different characteristics to, to, to heal. Uh, but the most important part is uh, that the mother is preventing uh, illness and that's the key. Uh, that was his training until he was 12 years old. Estos resumen de resúmenes. Entonces, de 12 hasta 18 años, ya tenía que ser ayudante, acompañar a una persona mayor, al abuelo, al tío, al padre. Una persona mayor que sabe curar ya, era ayudante. Al mismo tiempo, este de, de 12 a 18 años, aprendí el idioma y aprendí a conocer las plantas de diferentes zonas, porque el callao de Ocuyo, el médico de los cuatro suyos, los cuatro suyos están en el altiplano Valle Trópico, en cada uno hay alimento y planta medicinal, y la tierra también medicinal, porque el agua de una zona a otra zona a veces varía también. Okay, I'm summarizing a lot uh, what uh, the training of Akayawala is, but from uh, age 12 to age 18, uh, the uh, young trainee uh, is taken uh, by an elder, uh, the father, uncle, or, or an elder, who, who brings him along uh, to teach him the different uh, Uh, plants and, and animals uh, according to different regions. Uh, we have the suyus. Uh, the suyus represent the, uh, uh, the mountains, the valleys, uh, the jungle. There are four suyus, if I'm not wrong. And you have to learn how plants uh, change according to water conditions or climate conditions. And uh, that's part of the training. Uh, you have to tag along with an elder that is uh, teaching you. For example, the 18 hasta los 23, 24, 25 años, iba con una persona mayor, pues ya podía curar. Como era joven, a veces no sabía muchas cosas, preguntaba al mayor, cuando una, una, una enfermedad, pues difícil de curar. A veces con el, con el curandero del pueblo, el callaba yo mayor y él, y a veces otro más, una señora que sabía del parto, como por ejemplo. Todos participaban cuando era difícil el tratamiento una forma de aprender e intercambiar las ideas, ¿no? Ya de, desde los 18 hasta los 25 años. When you turn 18, uh, 18 to 24, uh, 25, you are able to start practicing uh, always uh, along an elder. Uh, you can start uh, doing diagnosis and, and some uh, healing practices, but always you have to be uh, close to an elder that is uh, guiding you in these practices. Uh, from uh, helping uh, giving birth uh, to a mother to uh, uh, practicing different uh, uh, healing practices. When we came to a pueblo or a una feria, when se reunían the pueblos de abajo, de arriba, se so los de arriba traían su conocimiento productos, los de abajo también el callao de su conocimiento. Pues esa era la forma de esto, no, de, de hacer ciencia, de investigar. Entonces, después de esto, ¿no? después de este, los, a los 25, 24 años, pues había una evaluación. El examen podía ser cualquier enfermedad, podía ser con por ejemplo, un catarro, un parto difícil, que tenía que saber resolver solo. Si no resolvía, pues esa la evaluación no podía ser callado. Por ejemplo, ¿cómo podemos reach uh, a point of, of expertise. Uh, how do, do we uh, do research? Uh, for example, we participate in, in, in fairs, in festivities in which people from the lowlands and the highlands get together and of course the, 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 their products, uh, their, uh, their herbal medicine is different and we have to identify those. And then we also get uh, testing when you are 24, 25, you have to be able to uh, face different uh, and difficult cases, uh, difficult uh, birth process or uh, uh, heart illness, uh, then that's your test to really become a, a, a healer. 
porque el callao ella, pues tenía que curar la enfermedad de una planta o también la enfermedad de un animal o curarse a sí mismo también para cuidar todo eso porque la madre tierra pues eso es un alimento y medicina pues si no lo cuida o por ejemplo este no hay un callaoya que le han seguido juicio en el año mil, 1747 la, la gobernación de Ibérica pues lo como estaba de, curaba plantas curaba animales estaba preveniendo, daba cursos para evitar enfermedades y curaba enfermedades también. Por envidia, pues, le han quitado los hijos, los animales, todo lo que tenía. Y a la cárcel, ¿no? Porque el conocimiento de esto no valía, estaba penalizado hasta hace unos 30 años. Uh, Cayabala no solo uh, es un healer de people, es también un healer de plantas y animales. Uh, Cayabala tiene que take care of of nature, the environment, because the environment is the one that is giving the Kayawala the knowledge. Uh, there is a case, uh, an example, that in 1747, uh, Kayawala uh, was persecuted by the colonial uh, uh, power, the Spanish. Uh, 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 everything was taken out of, 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 of him. Uh, uh, and actually, uh, the, the practice of this medicine was banned until probably 30 years ago. Por ejemplo, una un Callehuaya, pues estaba penalizado, era inferior, su conocimiento no valía, pero con los ibéricos cuando no podían curar, pues recién hacían valer, incluso los primeros médicos ibéricos que han llegado a, a Bolivia, se pues han dicho, no traigan aquí médicos, porque lo que hay aquí en, en América son mejores que hay, no lo tenemos, no lo traigan que no podían curar los médicos ibéricos, como en Canal de Panamá, por ejemplo, ¿no? hace 140 años, la mala del paludismo, también los mejores de los médicos del mundo curaron, cuando estaban acá con los franceses, ¿no? Entonces, con mate de cocaína curaron la malaria, se les dio. Eso es fruto de investigación. O sea, algunos médicos han dicho, esto es lo que nosotros, que usted mejor con universidad, no podemos curar, están con el diablo, son brujos, hay que, hay que quemarlos, imagínate, hasta ese extremo se llega. It's paradoxical that uh, even though uh, medical uh, medical uh, uh, people came or doctors came from Europe, uh, they couldn't uh, uh, heal people in the Americas. Uh, then they were always uh, calling uh, the, the local healers uh, to address problems. Just an example: 140 years ago, when the, Canon, the Panama Canal was uh, in the process of being built, uh, the the uh, uh, Westerners were suffering uh, heavy losses due to malaria, uh, and, and they called uh, uh, medical healers, traditional healers. The Kayawala came with the knowledge of kina uh, and uh, the uh, coca leaf uh, to relieve uh, the, the Europeans, the French, uh, who were developing the, the Panama Canal of, of that illness of malaria, was the only uh, well-known uh, uh, treatment for malaria for many, many years. Como por ejemplo, el Callaoya practica el sincretismo, respeta la, la cultura cristiana romana, digamos, porque con la mente se cura, con la confianza mental es una cosa muy importante. Los, por eso los psicólogos, psiquiatras utilizan eso. Aunque el buen médico, buen psicólogo, puede curar una enfermedad, en la medicina, en la cultura, puede curarla, pero tiene que comprenderlo, tiene que armonizarlo. Pero algunos dicen cuando dice lo que tiene en su idioma, se dice, no, esto no, no sabe, está hablando de cualquier cosa, pues no respetaba. Si respetaba, comprendía y podía curar cualquier cosa o una enfermedad. I forgot some, something from the last part. Is, uh, the Kayawalas were considered uh, 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 like uh, people with dark powers, like black magicians, uh, well, witches and things like that. Uh, but he says that uh, the Kayawal is a syncretic person. He uses, uh, understands uh, the cultures of, of the West uh, uh, and respects uh, uh, the cultures of the West, uh, Christianity and Judeo-Christian uh, beliefs, uh, because the, the work of the Kayawala is, is, is to get a balance, a harmony. Uh, through harmony, uh, you can uh, a treat uh, not only physical illness but also mental illness uh, and the Kayawala is some sort of uh, 
psychologist or psychiatrist to uh, in their practice. Como por ejemplo vamos a volver otra vez a la evaluación final para ser callaboyes. Se reunían callaboyes mayores de experiencia y se evaluaban. Se tenía que saber cualquier se lo, cualquier enfermedad se le ocurría preguntaban se respondía bien podía ser callaboyes. Si no podía ser también este artesano que hacía aguayos, pastor, agricultor, podía ser, no podía ser callaboyes. Porque era una gran responsabilidad, una gran responsabilidad de, esta, ¿no? de, de curar, porque la vida es una sola, decían. Si no sabe conservar la vida, si no sabe prevenir, ¿cómo va a ser callaboyes? O sea, que no podía ser callaboyes. Entonces, si se aplazaba, daba otros dos años, pero con otro callaboyes. Uh, the final testing. Uh to become a, a real Kayawaya uh, was to test the, the person. The person had to commit completely to healing practices, to prevention, and to balance. Uh, you cannot be also a peasant or a craftsman. Uh, you have to commit fully uh, to that. If you fail the test, you were given extra time uh, to find that commitment uh, to become uh, a healer. Entonces, si se aplazaba, quería ser siempre callaboya, se reclamaba porque no se entendía bien, no, no lo quería el profesor, el callaboya, el maestro, entonces, pues con otro callaboya tenía que viajar. Y con ese callaboya, pues era aprendiz y también podía curar, y después someterse otra vez a la evaluación. Podía, si aprueba, pues puede ser callaboya, si no, pues o, o sea, era una, un estudio bien serio. Y también ahora, para concluir esta parte de la evaluación, tal vez después habrá preguntas, seguro vamos a extender, responderlo, ¿no? Entonces, o sea que el callaboya, no, decimos en este momento, porque yo soy callaboya, soy médico, las dos cosas. Tengo la suerte, soy el primer profesional de un callaboya. ¿no? Entonces, el callaboya, pues dice, actualmente hay ciencia en las universidades avanzadas, muy importante, no, sé, no podemos desechar. Pero en las universidades, más que todo, enseñan el área de salud para curar enfermedades. Pero también nos enseña en la universidad a prevenir. Pero la mayoría de los médicos no lo utilizamos, muy poco. Entonces, la medicina tradicional que lleva más que todo es prevenir. Imagínate, vamos a estar enfermos por comer alimentos chatarra. O sea que ¿ala? mucho azúcar, muchas niñas blancas, falta de actividad física. Falta de bailar sin tomar, claro, sin fumar. ¿Eh? Claro, bailar, hacer deporte, nadar, subir, bajar cerros, actividad física. Comer bien, pero con, tiene que conocer su organismo. Como ejemplo voy a poner. Si tienes presión alta, como familia tienes presión alta, pues nada de café, nada de mucha carne muerta, nada de poco sal, comer ajo, lima y toronja, frutas y verduras. Okay, this is, this is incredible, but what is going on? Sorry. <laughs> uh, if, in order to become a Kayawala, and if you fail the test, you have to find another uh, uh, teacher to tag along and try to succeed in the, in the process of being, being accepted. Uh, but remember that the Kayawala, uh, and he was also making a note, uh, he's also a practitioner, a, phys a physician. Uh, actually, he was the first uh, 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 professional of, of his caste, of the Kayawalas. Uh, but the most important task of the Kayawala is uh, prevention, right? It's to, to find uh, uh, the right balance and to give that message. And he was giving incredible messages that uh, uh, you understood better <laughs> than me. Uh, if you are not eating well, if you are eat, uh, having too much sugar, if you are eating you know, uh, bad foods, uh, if you are not exercising, uh, if you don't go up and down the hills, if you don't swim, if you, if, if you are not uh, doing well for your body, of course, you're going to get sick. That's the, the most important task of the Kayawala prevention, to understand and to, to find and to tune that kind of message to the community. El Kayawala actualmente es patrimonio y material reconocido por la UNESCO hace 10 años. Por todas las curaciones que ha hecho a presidentes en Canal de Panamá, Francia, todo eso. En Francia, hablando en el año 1899, la exposición universal. Entonces, en Perú, en Leguía, en 1908-6, el Ecuador, pues también, 
curado a la familia cuando no hay ningún médico podía curar por todos estos patrimonios. Entonces en Bolivia hace 30 años organizamos un somete a la Sociedad Boliviana de Medicina Tradicional, más los callaboyas que reconoce el gobierno primera vez y despenaliza, entonces declara capital de la medicina tradicional de Bolivia a la tierra de los callaboyas, que está en cerca justo en el norte de La Paz, en La Paz. Ok, uh, he was also saying something about the university. I mean, Callawales knowledge is a different knowledge uh, and now has been validated uh, 30 years ago, uh, recognized uh, through the work of many of their practitioners uh, 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 as, as, as a, a live uh, patrimony. Actually, it was also recognized by UNESCO uh, uh, recently as a material uh, patrimony of, of the world. And uh, through their work uh, uh, in Bolivia, They have been recognized uh, uh, is not banned anymore it's not uh, forbidden uh, the practice of the Kayawala they have an institute and uh, uh, has been a long uh, journey to be uh, now a part of the uh, structure of public uh, uh, public health in Bolivia nosotros hemos estado también este no en México con por ejemplo con los soya Soy es uno de los primeros médicos de México que ha ocupado medicina siendo médico. En Perú, pues también este Cabiese, que en paz descanse, también se ha ocupado, también ha creado el Instituto de Medicina Tradicional Peruana. En Bolivia, antes lo creamos, el Instituto Boliviano de Medicina Tradicional de Callaguaya, o Callaguayo, ¿no? Todo eso. Y pues yo puedo estar hablando con, por ejemplo, hace 30 años empecé un libro. ¿Qué vas a enseñar? ¿Qué es la medicina que hay en escrito 300 páginas? Estaba hablando que hace dos años, un año, uh, estaba hablando de una enfermedad nada más, de la coca nada más, los alcaloides. La coca era uno de los alimentos, medicinas principales. Puede estar hablando, los alcaloides puede estar hablando pues, dos, tres horas, de la coca solamente de una planta. Pues ahora más bien está en internet, ¿no? Todo, la, el perigil, todo está en internet, pero no hay mucho. ¿De dónde salen los medicamentos? De los animales, de las plantas y de la madre tierra. No sale de, del aire, no hay milagro. O sea que, pero solamente hay que conocer las propiedades. Los alcaloides, el espíritu de una planta, de un animal, es cierto que nos puede hacer bien, pues también hay que conocer. Y conocer su organismo, porque hay alimentos y plantas que pueden deprimir la cabecita, que pueden estimular, y todo el organismo también. Eso es, ¿no? Todos. Solamente hay que conocerlo para eso, para cuidar las plantas y animales. El hombre es justo lo que come, pero tiene que ser natural, variado, balanceado de la zona de la época. Entonces voy a dar paso, que no estamos hablando mucho, pero los hermanos también pues, tienen mucho que hablar, tal vez cosas más importantes que esta. ¿no? Y también quiero decir, el que hace se puede equivocar. Solamente el que no habla, el que no hace nada, no tiene derecho a equivocarse. Entonces, si yo me, o si yo me equivoqué algo, ¿no? o sea, tal vez un maestro, esto, maestro sí. ¿no? Estarán, ¿no? Los conocimientos, porque así es, pero nosotros hemos ayudado a despenalizar la medicina en América y en el mundo juntamente con los chinos. La cultura que hay el primer patrimonio inmaterial de la humanidad reconocido por la UNESCO por todos los aportes que ha hecho la humanidad. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, you hear it better than me. He was, just to summarize, he said, there, we are facing an emergence or reemergence of traditional knowledge and traditional medicines in the Americas. He has been working with people in Mexico, in Peru, uh, and it's happening right here. We are uh, 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 looking at this uh, uh, process. Uh, he was giving some uh, examples that uh, this knowledge also has to be documented through books and through research. Uh, they have been doing it, but of course it's hard. Uh, he was just giving an example of, of the coca leaf and all the uh, prop properties of that of that plant, as as many other plants. That uh, the message is we have the message is we have to recognize the the value of these knowledges, uh, the properties of the plants, the animals. We have to recognize that there is knowledge and value in their practice. There is an Asian knowledge knowledge that is also science, and that uh, he's going to give the word to. Uh, the brothers and sisters in the table because there's much more to, to come. Thank you so much. Last thing. Last thing.
casi 85, 90%. 10% con la otra medicina que me enseñaron en Cuba y España, me enseñaron en Bolivia, me enseñaron en Cuba. Entonces, de eso hablo, lo único, he curado presidente, imagínense, ¿no? en, en Bolivia, he curado mucha gente también que dicen que la comida es importante, porque todos somos importantes. As a, as a physician, I've been using 85% of traditional medicine medicine in my practice, 10 or 15% of Western medicine, uh, because I was trained as a medical doctor, and I, I've been practicing uh, not with uh, governors, also with presidents, then this is a knowledge that is relevant. Uh, so thank you. Muchas gracias. Thank, thank you very much. Doctor Kiswi, gracias por uh, explicarnos no solo el aprendizaje, uh, pero, tam sin, uh, pero también la, como, como, como lo digo en español, este, la perspectiva de holismo y de sincretismo. También es muy, muy importante. Vale. Next, I would like to introduce um, Doctor, or professor, I should say dean, actually. Um, dean Eliseo Torres from the University of New Mexico. Um, uh, uh, dean Torres is um, one of the people through his many writings and books responsible for disseminating greater knowledge about curanderismo um, in the um, United States. So with further ado, we'll be speaking about curandero, a way of life. Thank you. Primeramente quiero felicitarlo, doctor uh, Álvarez, porque usted practica la medicina holística, ha combinado la medicina tradicional con la medicina moderna alopática, y es lo que nosotros intentamos de hacerlo. Felicito, doctor. I, I, I want to, yeah, I want to congratulate Dr. Álvarez because he is doing what we have been promoting, and that is um, practicing holistic medicine, being able to combine his allopathic training as a medical doctor and his traditional training as a curandero to promote holistic healing. And it's wonderful to hear that. Um, my name is Eliseo, and they call me Cheo Torres. I'm in New Mexico. I've been there eight, eight, 19 years almost. Uh, lived up next to Dr. Merckx, who now has been here several years at Duke. We were neighbors and we both worked at the University of New Mexico. My mother was not a curandera, but she should have been one. We, we, lived, we lived in the country, uh, far away from doctors, and she would tell us, don't you dare get sick. And if you do, I'm going to, to heal you. I'm going to take care of your illness. And she did, all six of us, through rituals, through medicinal plants, through the things that Dr. Alvarez talked about. She kept us healthy. We weren't insured. And it wasn't later on that I moved to the university and, and worked with an uh, archaeologist, anthropologist friend of mine who became my major advisor at the university, Dr. Bittinger, and I traveled to Mexico for 20 years. Um, he was interested in pyramids. I was interested in curanderos. And I interviewed many, many curanderos and became an apprentice under a curandero. You'll see his picture in a minute by the name of Crescencio Alvarado, better known as Chenchito. Chenchito was a fidencista. He would channel spirits and he would do his healing under a trance. But he was a wonderful person. And I apprenticed under him for a few years, brought him to the university and to lecture to students. And then I moved to New Mexico in 1995 and discovered the diversity of New Mexico, a strong Native American culture and Latino culture. And I continued my studies, wrote about five books already, one in Spanish and it's printed in Mexico on the topic. And I started teaching a class 14 years ago on the, on the topic, with 30 students now, we have over 250 students. This semester, the class is online And, and I've just been approved for a MOOC class, which will be free. So I hope that uh, you'll take advantage of some of those opportunities. And thank you for the invitation. I do have some slides 
to give you an idea of what we're doing with this topic and how we're impacting, I think, the way of thinking of people. Um, the, what is curanderismo? It's the art of Mexican folk healing that, that comes from the word curar, which means to heal. And it's a holistic approach to healing, like Dr. Alvarez mentioned, treating body, mind, and spirit. If you go to a physician, it's mostly the body, sometimes the mind if you're a little crazy, but rarely the spirit. So when you bring all three aspects together, you have a holistic approach to healing. Um, and there's three levels of curanderismo, and, and, and I can't see the screen very well, so I'm going to have to turn around if you'll excuse me. Uh, the material level is the first level where we work with plants, candles, incense, tinctures, microdose. My, what's a microdosis? It's a water base um, liquid that comes from a tincture. A tincture is alcohol base. Uh, this was pretty much um, invented by uh, Dr. Martinez in Mexico and it's very, very effective. A little bit like homeopathic medicine. And then amulets, all sorts of, of items that bring about certain needs. And then the spiritual level, where the curandero is actually the medium, or as my good friend, uh, curandera Elena, uh, Elena used to say, it's the soul retrieval concept. And I'll discuss this in a, in a few minutes. And then the last and most difficult level is the mental level, where the curandero channels mental vibrations to the patient. And if you want a copy of this, you're more than free to, to get a copy of this. Mm -hmm. the, let me just talk a little bit about this, the spiritual and the mental levels. Um, it's, difficult, it's difficult for me to separate both levels. So I've combined both levels, the spiritual and the mental level. Um, and the things that, that we study and we practice is evil eye or mal de ojo which is caused by a excessive admiration. If you stare at a baby who are more susceptible to this, you could make that baby sick. Where does this ritual come from? It comes from the Moors. The Moors who were in Spain some seven to hundred years to a thousand years, we don't even know how long they were there. They brought it to the New World or to Mexico. They brought it to the States. So it's a very interesting phenomenon. The other one is susto or magical fright. It's a traumatic experience related to an incident. Um, now we believe that a lot of PTSD can be treated in this form, where you take uh, certain branches, certain plants, and you sweep the body uh, of these negative vibrations. Okay? Um, plants such as uh, basil, albacar, uh, irul, California pepper tree, ruda, rue, or rosemary, romero. All of them have nice fragrances. The other rituals is caída de, mo caída de mollera, when, or this is a fallen fontanel on babies. When they fall from a crib, you toss the baby in the air. And the other one is empacho. You ate something raw, it's stuck in your stomach, and you massage the belly and then the back, and you pull on the skin, and you hear a popping sound, which means that it's been dislodged. The other one is bilis and muina, both anger illness. There was a study done here at your university a few years back on anger. And the researcher labeled this as one of the serious illnesses right along cigarette smoking and alcoholism. It, it, it kills you if you don't control it. Curanderos have had a ritual to deal with anger. One is suppress anger and the other is outer outward rage. We won't go into the rituals, but there's interesting ways to deal with both of those. Okay? Let me tell you a little bit about the class. As I mentioned, um, I taught the class in Texas 20 years ago to nursing students at Texas A&M University, Corpus Christi. I, I, when I moved to New Mexico, I wasn't sure if I was going to continue teaching the class, but, but I did. In fact, we took a group of students to Mexico for the first class, which was a wonderful experience to Cuernavaca, to work with curanderos. But there were only 15 students, and I, I kept thinking, we ought to be able to reach 
a bigger audience. So I decided to offer the class 14 years ago. We started with 30 students. The second year, it probably jumped up to 75. Last year, we had 250 students. They're coming from all over. There is a hunger, there's an interest to rediscover a culture and to learn more about this wonderful tradition. And this semester, I'm teaching the class online. And I thought I would do 20 students. Uh, I'm up to 35, so I think I'm just going to cut it at 35. But the interest is there. Um, this is the online class. And then it's just been approved for, for a, a MOOC, a massive open online class. It will be offered for free. Uh, and it's in both languages, Spanish and English. And, and I'm going to give you an idea of what we're offering in this class. Um, my colleague, Dr. Arturo Ornelas, um, was trained in Switzerland. He's Mexican. He was trained in Switzerland. And he was provost of the State University of Morelos in Cuernavaca, about 40,000 students. Got tired of being an administrator, opened up a school 20 years ago for curanderos, a holistic school. And he's worked with hundreds, if not thousands, of curanderos from all over Mexico, Central America, and South America. And he's the one that I work with for the class. We bring some of his curandero instructors to be in the States as part of the faculty. Right? Here's one of the uh, curanderas, probably one of the best curanderas that I have ever worked with. Her name is Rita Navarrete. She's from Mexico City. And she is a temascalera. She specializes with temascales. Ustedes tienen los temascales en, en Bolivia, doctor, ¿verdad? Los temascales los tienen? Los llaman temascales, ¿no? Sí. They exist all over the world, temascales, pretty much. The Mexican temascal um, was not really very popular. It, we didn't know much about the Mexican Temazcal in New Mexico. The native Temazcal exists there, uh, especially the Apaches, uh, Lakotas that have moved into New Mexico, which is a masculine Temazcal. It's a stronger sweat lodge. The Mexican is a feminine Temazcal. It's a softer sweat lodge. So we started constructing Temazcals, and Rit, with Rita's help, this is, she's, this is in a Temazcal in Albuquerque. So we've built four Temascals now. And the, the students that are in the class use the Temascals during the two-week course. And here's um, another one of our instructors, Tomás Enos. He was trained in Oaxaca. He, he, his Spanish is perfect. And he was trained by curanderas in Oaxaca, mostly on herbology. So he teaches all the plants not all, but many plants of the Southwest, plants that, are, that, that are, are, do well in New Mexico, but in other areas of the Southwest, and their medicinal usage, and the preparation of these plants, either through a tincture, a salve, a microdosis. Huh? Uh, we also, in our team, is a, a, a curandero from Peru, Nino. Nino, um, fortunately, married a New Mexican, Bernadette. Bernadette Torres. And so he now they have a garden called Chabeta Garden where they teach classes, but he's also part of our team. He works a lot with sacred tobacco. And, and his wife, Bernadette, is a registered herbalist, also has been trained in Mexico. Here we have Tonita working with clay therapy, which is very popular in, in with a lot of the curanderos. And now we teach students how to deal work with clay uh, in a lot of their, their therapies. And Tonita um, became a curandera about a year ago. She was under 40 medications. Uh, she had Bell's palsy. Um, she was overweight. Met the curandera, especially Rita. Rita took her to Mexico City. Worked with Tonita. Tonita enrolled in the school that Dr. Ornelas has. Lost 100 pounds. Is off of all her medications and is one of the top curanderas now in, in the Albuquerque area. Okay. Here's Tana, also another curandera. 
working with empacho and how you deal with empacho. Supposedly, empacho is, is you've eaten something with, when you have empacho and that's been stuck in the intestinal tract. And you're trying to dislodge that and you massage uh, the belly and then the back and you, you pull the skin and you do hear that popping sound. And, it, and then there's a nice soothing massage with empacho. Um, and Tana is a wonderful curandera, a great sobadora. We don't call her mas, a, mas, a masur or masus, but we call them sobadoras. Here's Rita again with fire cupping or ventosas. Ventosas is cupping. Most of you may be familiar with the Chinese cupping. This is the Mexican cupping. Uh, you light a fire under the cup, it, it, they place it on the skin, it pops the skin up, and you, in Mexico, they move the cup around, uh, and it pulls a lot of stagnated blood, and it's just a wonderful, wonderful massage. It, 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 it also relaxes your muscles, and people that have not had a, a, a true uh, ventosa uh, don't realize how therapeutic it can be. We teach the students how to do ventosas. Here's uh, Donita and Rita doing a, a session on juice therapy. The first thing that the curanderas ask you is about your diet. And they find out whether it's related to your illness. So they teach you how to eat healthy, how to juice healthy, and how to prevent illnesses before they even happen. And here they're working with what they call manteadas. They take a shawl, well, in the, in the villages they use a shawl, for pregnant women, especially who have babies who are bridged, or for the elderly whose bones are brittle, or for young kids who are sensitive, they're, they're still growing, they they're, see what Rita's doing. Sometimes the two of them work together you lie on, the, on, this, on this shawl, and they move your body around to adjust your body. It's just a very soothing uh, way to align your body. And, and this was a lost art in Mexico. It's coming back, not only in Mexico, but in the Southwest. And here's my good compadre, uh, uh, Laurencio Nunez. Laurencio is from Oaxaca. Laurencio's grandmother was a famous curandera, worked with Maria Sabina. Some of you have heard of Maria Sabina, a famous curandera. And Laurencio became a curandero, had never traveled outside of Mexico until we brought him to Albuquerque. He is one of the most gracious and most humble individuals and one of the best curanderos that does limpias or spiritual cleansings or energetic cleansings. And he sweeps your body with an egg that absorbs the negative vibrations. And then he uses certain plants to sweep your body. And he uses incense, which is called copal, from the copal tree. And by the time he finishes with you, you feel like a baby. You just so feel so relaxed and so clean of whatever energy you were carrying. The idea is that we all absorb certain negative energies that are with us, and he's doing a clean scene. And he's been coming for the last three years. Just a, an adorable person, and all the students fall in love with Laurencio. And here, uh, Rita also specializes Risa Terapia, laugh therapy. Um, any of you familiar with Norman Cousin? Um, you, you're familiar. Uh, Gil, Norman Cousin, Dr. Cousin, was dying from an illness and that was affecting his immune system. He didn't know what to do, so he started laughing, started watching TV, uh, the Marx Brothers, a lot of uh, 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 funny shows, and he laughed and he laughed, and after a while, for every 30 minutes of laughter, he was being pain-free for about an hour. Well, this life-threatening disease according to him, was, was cured through laughter. So Rita has developed a laugh therapy. He tells people, you're not as sick as you think. Let's laugh. Let's drink a little wine. 
and let's party a little bit. And, and that's what the famous Nino Fidencio used to do back in the 1920s. And it's been very, very effective. Produces endorphins, a natural painkiller, and does a lot of wonderful things to you. We just need to laugh a little bit more. Okay? And this last summer, we brought a group of healers from Uganda, from Africa. And they were in several panels with the curanderos from Mexico and from Peru. And guess what? There's so many similarities, more similarities and differences. And we're beginning to start working with other cultures so that they get together and they can share and they can learn from one another. We're also working with Native Americans from New Mexico and natives from Mexico on the sweat lodges, and they're comparing rituals and techniques. And it's incredible how we're beginning to develop new, new health systems. They are. We're not. We're just, we're just bringing them together. Here's a few photos of the, uh, of the classes. Here's a couple of curanderos uh, demonstrating the usage of the egg on treating mal de ojo. You break the egg in a glass of water, you diagnose the egg to see whether you had uh, mal de ojo. Here's an opening. Every uh, morning before the class, we have an opening ceremony. And there's, here's the, one of these opening ceremonies. Okay? Here's Dr. Ornelas also at the opening ceremony. Here's a couple of curanderos that came uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, Don Esteban Torres and his daughter. He's, he's, he's a, he comes from a lineage of curanderos that dates back hundreds of years. Now his daughter is a curandera, his wife is a curandera, the whole family are curanderos. Here's a demonstration in the class. So That's okay. Actually, we're almost, uh, we can go a little bit fast. If, and if not, I, we, yeah, we can go a little bit fast on that. Uh, here's, uh, and, yeah, here he we're showing students how to prepare tinctures. Uh, this is a Mayan healer, Roberto. Roberto is a Temascalero. He's the one that's been constructing the sweat lodges in, in uh, Albuquerque. Okay. Here's Tonita, also at an opening ceremony. I talked about her. Here's Belia. She comes from a village. She's Mexican native. Powerful, powerful healer, especially with limpias. Here's a temazcal that I'm talking about. This one is in Oaxaca. We have four <coughs> sweat lodges similar to these, a little bit bigger. Very, very effective. Uh, it's incredible the results that we're getting from the usage of temazcals. Okay. Here's a group of students in a temazcal in Oaxaca next to the beach. And uh, they, these are nursing students and occupational therapy students. Now we don't have to go to Oaxaca. We have them in, in Albuquerque. Here's a group of students training to be curanderos in Oaxaca. We take students to, to Oaxaca because they're losing some of the traditions. And, I, and I, I discussed three curanderos that were quite popular back turn of the century, Don Pedrito Jaramillo, uh, who used water to heal and um, basic things, herbs. Teresita, who came from Chihuahua to, to New Mexico, then wound up in... St. Louis and, and uh, even New York. Well, she's a, a great curandera. Her strengths were prophecy and, and uh, um, laughter also. And then the last curandero, Nino Fidencio, who was um, a spiritualist. And um, my teacher was a fidencista. I'm going to stop there because my time is up. But I, I, I'd, I'd like to also invite, how many of you students are in the traditional medicine class? I thought some of you. Dr. Boyd, the students? No, I thought uh, maybe I thought. <laughs> it doesn't really matter, but if, if you're interested in the summer class, it's a two week class. Uh, this summer it's going to be July the 14th through the 25th. So I hope you can join us and for a wonderful experience. You don't even have to be a student. Uh, I think Dr. Merckx might join us this year. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Um, Dr. Torres. I find it interesting, in particular, with something like susto and mal de ojo, how they differ um, in terms of, well, the understanding's the same, but they differ so much in treatment from culture to culture. Um, my research site is in Guatemala. One of the things I have to warn our students about as they go down is when the, the women will take their babies out of their wraps in the clinic is the 
the kids immediately want to run to the children and just say beautiful and play with them. And it's like our lesson one in cultural confidence is, uh, yes, explaining mal de ojo. Um, our next speaker is Christopher Clayton. Chris is actually a graduate of Duke and right now is on a Fulbright scholarship in, um, well, has just finished up in Bolivia and is now in um, Ecuador. And he has been working on understanding more uh, the issues um, in the relationship between biomedical and indigenous paradigms in the Andean community. Chris. So I think that my talk today is going to be a slightly different perspective. Um, I'm a recent graduate of Duke Global Health and Spanish and Latin American Studies Department. So I'm hoping to bring a little bit of a public health perspective and a discussion of intercultural medicine, where that's going. And um, I know the pamphlets and everything say Bolivia and Ecuador. I just started in Ecuador. So I'm going to focus mostly on Bolivia. Um, but I'll talk a little bit about future directions in Ecuador for sure. So the title of my talk is El Camino a la Salud, or if this will advance, The Path to Health, Traditional Medicine and Healthcare Decision Making in Urban Bolivia and Ecuador. Um, I also just wanted to say we are so lucky to have this panel here today. Um, really amazing people. Uh, this perspective that they both shared, one on education and one on practicing, is so important in moving towards intercultural medicine and the potential um, benefits that can come from that. And they've brought up a lot of the challenges as well, so I'll try to explain that a little bit as well. So a quick overview on what I hope to cover today. We're we talking about intercultural health in Bolivia, a short introduction, uh, talking about healthcare trajectories specifically in an urban environment. Um, the delegation para el fomento de la interculturalidad, or for the fostering of interculturality, uh, who was my partner organization in Bolivia. Uh, the current studies, uh, some completed, some underway, a registry of traditional healers that the delegation is working on, and lastly, Ecuador and future directions. So a little on intercultural health in Bolivia. So like uh, Dr. Quispe mentioned, um, traditional medicine was something that was forbidden. It, you couldn't practice it for quite some time. Um, the 1980s, that changed, and the country opened up towards accepting traditional medicine. Uh, for the very first time in 2006, traditional medicine entered the national constitution. And with that movement, it basically said that everyone was entitled to whatever medicine they preferred, that being traditional or biomedicine. Since then, there have been an extraordinary number of iterations of the goals of intercultural health and the integration of traditional medicine, both through legislation, informally and formally. Um, and this quote here comes from one of the most recent of that, a document produced by the Ministry of Health and Sports in 2013. And the quote reads, to strengthen and articulate traditional medicine in all comprehensive health networks in order to offer the Bolivian public quality, compassionate service within the framework of the universal health system, eliminating sociocultural barriers through the formation of policies, standards, regulations, and the execution of national programs. So that's quite a mouthful. <laughs> and this is kind of what we've seen is over the years, the iterations of this goal have become more wide sweeping. Um, this is a huge amount to accomplish. And all of those things at the end, the policy, standard regulations, and national programs have really yet to be defined. So intercultural health is still very much a challenge for Bolivia. Um, there's a lot of great legislation that supports it, but the answers of how it will be achieved are still yet to be seen. A lot of the first efforts in this have happened in rural areas, um, largely ignoring urban populations, pretty much under the assumption that when biomedical resources are present, people will eventually find their way to them. But as we'll hopefully see later, that's not the case. So in these rural areas, it was pretty easy to predict how people would move around. And there was some collaboration between traditional healers in the communities and clinics and hospitals that entered the area. So they would try to bring traditional healers into the hospitals in order to basically bring people in who had a traditional etiology of disease, who preferred traditional providers, into the hands of a biomedical practitioner. And what happened frequently was that the biomedical practitioner wanted to be in a position of control over the traditional healer. We didn't have people like Dr. Kispe who were able to think in both worlds at once. We had people who thought biomedicine is the way, and this is a way of getting more people to biomedicine. So instead of intercultural health as it was 
thought of in the beginning as being an equal balance between traditional medicine and biomedicine, we were having biomedicine really usurp the authority of these traditional providers. Because of that, traditional pro providers who really respected their tradition, those who had been trained like Dr. Kispe through all of these years who had taken tests, they didn't see themselves working in these hospitals and moved away from them. That opened the door to traditional healers who didn't have that much training going into these hospitals, which further created distrust among the patient population. Patients who knew their traditional healers, they didn't see them in those hospitals, so they didn't enter. So a lot of these experiments have sort of been a little bit of a failure. Um, and we're still looking for ways to try to figure out how these things can exist on equal levels. But when we move into urban environments, this gets really further complicated. So in urban environments, you don't only have one world of traditional medicine and one world of biomedicine. You have a huge mixture. So you see a lot of words up here. We have the Kayawaya, uh, which has already been spoken about. But we have amautas, parteras, curanderos, chifleras, naturistas, and yateris. These are all different types of vendors or providers of traditional medicine, all with different viewpoints. Um, many of them hold the Andean cosmovision as a base, but a lot of them don't see eye to eye with each other um, in terms of how traditional medicine should be provided. Um, and some of them are simply vendors. Naturistas, chifleras typically just sell these herbs, but they're making their own recommendations on the side. Um, along with this mixture, we have hospitals, clinics, NGOs, all of these healthcare organizations that represent biomedicine. It's not just one place to go. And we have things like SUMI, which is Seguro Universal Materno Infantil, so uh, insurance for mothers and infants. And that is highly incentivizing the use of biomedical practitioners for mothers and infants by giving them benefits for going to their appointments monthly. Um, so that's pulling people in who might not have gone to biomedicine in the first place. So when you get this huge, complex network of healthcare providers, including family, as you see down here, and community with all of their recommendations, there's pretty much no way to predict where a patient is going to go. So we have our, uh, you could say, the sacred pair there, male and female, as you find in Bolivian culture, the chacha wanmi, as it's called. Those are going to represent our patients. And it's difficult to see where they're going to go in a healthcare trajectory. But there's been two theories that have really come up that have tried to explain how this works in urban environments. One is healer shopping uh, that came up in the 1980s out of research in various African nations. Um, and the other is Labirinto de Curación, which came up about last year by Carmen Beatriz Losa, um, who is a historian and anthropologist in Bolivia and also uh, Dr. Kispe's wife. So <laughs> that's a little interesting there. So um, healer shopping, the basic definition of that is that people shop for, healer, for healers, for cures, for doctors, um, in the same way you would shop for a different for groceries or for a new car or something like that. You go place to place and kind of return home with all of these influences and make your decision from there. The labyrinth uh, was introduced to describe these complex environments um, using the metaphor that you have multiple points of entry, multiple points of exit, um, and a lot of dead ends. It sort of explained the fact that a lot of the times this doesn't lead to healing. Um, so Carmen did, uh, wrote a wonderful book, definitely look it up, write her name down, uh, called Labyrintho de Curación. I believe it has a subtitle. Um, but basically what she looked at was how people navigate the healthcare environment. Um, she did this through informal conversations with people, and um, this is something that really interested me, something that I wanted to look at further in a more formal research public health setting. So moving on from that, um, when I went to Bolivia, I partnered with the Delegation for the Fostering of Interculturality, uh, which was under the municipal government of La Paz. And some of you may recognize Marcelo Fernandez Osco there. Um, he is a Duke alumni, <laughs> and uh, one of the great things about this organization in particular is that Marcelo studied here, um, doing cultural studies, studying what interculturality was. He's very much a scholar, and he is now heading this government organization that is moving towards reaching interculturality. So it gives me personally a lot of hope that interculturality can mean what it was meant to mean theoretically and not what it has sometimes been turned into by politics. So they've been a great 
uh, organization to work with. They focus on many areas. Traditional medicine is just one of them. Seven people are trying to accomplish interculturality for all of La Paz, so they have a lot of work to do. Um, so to talk a little bit about the studies we did with them, um, when I arrived, I found a stack of surveys that were done at the Feria del Prado, which is a big citywide fair that happens on many Sundays throughout the year. So they had surveyed uh, people at this fair, just a random cross-section, on their views of traditional medicine and discrimination. Um, so when I arrived, no one had looked at this data yet. So I put it all into Excel, went through, and pulled out some interesting numbers, and we thought, you know, we're arriving at the one year anniversary of this, let's do it again. So we launched the survey again, added a few more questions that were particularly interesting to me, um, and then some demographic information that we didn't have before. So you'll see the demographic breakdown. That is from the 2013 survey of 405 participants. Um, we had 46% male, 54% female, age ranged from 11 to, 40, uh, to 85, mean age was 35. Um, and what we actually saw between the two years, although we don't have demographic data from the first year, is that answers to the questions that were common were remarkably similar. There was no statistic, statistical significance between the years. So we went ahead and lumped all of that together to give you a few percentages that came out of this. And this will show kind of a baseline of where the city is at in terms of viewing traditional medicine, what their opinions are. So 72% of participants surveyed had used traditional medicine. 74% of those participants who had used traditional medicine were satisfied with their experience after the fact. We have 51% of participants reported never being asked by a physician, that being a biomedical physician, never being asked about traditional medicine, never entered a, uh, a conversation. And 48% of participants reported being discriminated against while seeking medical attention in a hospital or a clinic. So that was a pretty shocking statistic. Um, and this is really tied to how people make their healthcare decisions. If they feel discriminated against, if they feel like they can't trust a certain resource, they're far more likely to go elsewhere and kind of get lost in that labyrinth. Oops, sorry, go back one. There we go. 81% um, of participants surveyed agree with creating spaces for traditional medicine in hospitals. And 64% of participants believe that traditional medicine has the same importance as biomedicine, which was a really wonderful statistic that was able to come out of that as well. Um, and then lastly, looking at age and gender, it didn't correlate with the responses at all, which um, is a really great piece of data for me because I hear all of the time traditional medicine is disappearing when people grow up in a city and they see biomedicine all around them, they're not going to use it. But 11-year-olds were just as likely as 85-year-olds to say they had used traditional medicine, say that they thought it was just as important, and say that they were satisfied with the experience. So it shows that it's not disappearing anytime soon. But although this study was um, very interesting, it's still just a start. Uh, you can't necessarily say that the population was representative. We hoped it was. We did our best. But um, it's a great baseline to show how things are looking in a city like La Paz. But I wanted to move on from there and go more in depth. Quantitative surveys for something like this, is, they're not always the best. They don't uncover all of these stories that really lead to theories like the labyrinth. Um, so I followed it up with in-depth interviews at a hospital in El Alto, which is the city that is just bordering La Paz. So I did 25 semi-structured interviews with mothers who were between the age of about 19 and 30. And uh, we talked about different themes, traditional medicine, healthcare decisions, discrimination, and then most importantly, communication with their providers at this hospital about traditional medicine, whether they had asked about it, whether they felt comfortable talking about it. So these interviews were totally fascinating. I'm in the painful process of transcribing them through the screams of many babies because it was a very busy hospital. Um, and I should mention that this hospital, uh, sponsors sue me, so they sponsored that insurance. So they're bringing mothers in, highly incentivized to be there. So it was a really great population to look at because intercultural health in its conception for the Bolivian government was a way to try to reduce maternal and child morbidity mortality because mothers were seen as at risk because they were using traditional medicine for birth, they were using it instead of going to um, pediatric consultations. So. It was a way to try to bring mothers into the hands of biomedical providers, really. So my hope was to show these biomedical providers that their patients were doing a lot of things that they 
had no idea about, that their patients would never share with them because they didn't feel comfortable, and try to uncover why they didn't feel comfortable doing that. So though it's still in the process of analysis, um, a couple of stories really stood out and really highlight that labyrinth theory, really support the multiple points of entry and the dead ends. So we had patients who said that they would consult a yatiri before they went anywhere. The minute they were sick, they would go talk to a yatiri. The yatiri would le read coca leaves and decide whether or not it was something that could be cured by traditional medicine or cured by biomedicine. Um, but this woman also told me that you can't trust one yatiri. You have to go to three. Um, so you have to go to three and take the sum of their results. And this is something that you see a lot in these urban environments is because a big commerce has kind of grown around traditional medicine. So you see a lot of people who get into the business who haven't had the years of training like that someone like Dr. Kispe would. They're called charlatans um, <laughs> locally. So this woman knew that it was hard to trust Yatiri, so she would go to three before she made any decision. Um, I had another woman who had a lump in her breast and thought it could be cancer. And she told the pediatrician, the pediatrician told her, we can't do that here. We are not oncologists. Go somewhere else. So she went to her grandmother, who lives in Provincia, who is a traditional healer, um, in no formal sense, but has been healing her community for her entire life. Um, her grandmother said, cancer is a new disease. That's not something that traditional medicine can cure, but we'll give it our best shot. So they tried it. It didn't work. So she went to a specialist after that. The specialist told her that she needed surgery, and she heard surgery and ran the other direction. She didn't trust surgery. She was terrified of it. She had friends who had died during surgery, and it was economically impossible for her. So she hit a dead end and stopped caring about her health problem. So these kind of illustrate where intercultural health can really be of use. It can really bring these conversations into one place and help patients not get lost in this labyrinth find a way out, find healing, um, and also find ways to practice preventative health. That is one of the most important parts of traditional medicine. So hopefully um, I'll be able to publish a manuscript out of this, share more of those stories, but give you a little glimpse right there. Um, moving on from that, the organization that I was working with was also working on a registry of traditional healers, and this was in order to support a traditional medicine center that will be opening hopefully later this month if everything goes according to plan. The traditional medicine center will be called Kuyan Uta and it will be located pretty much in the heart of La Paz and be the first of its kind. It's going to be a center for information and orientation for traditional medicine. So they will not be able to practice traditional medicine there because it is sponsored by the municipal government and that liability is a little risky. Um, but they will be an area for people to come and learn more, to get advice, to get advice on prevention, um, to have a place where they can see traditional medicine starting to take a fixture in the city. And this is really important in moving towards intercultural health, that traditional medicine has a place to support itself, to become something that can really stand for itself when it comes to that collaboration, so that there aren't those situations where the traditional healer gets usurped by the biomedical practitioner. So as part of this center that's opening up, uh, we're doing a registry surveying traditional healers on how they identify, if they identify as a Kayowaya, as an Amauta, as one of these things, um, how often they practice, what they cure, what they don't cure, where they work, how often they work, um, and how much money they charge. So hopefully we'll have a Rolodex, really, of these traditional healers at the end and see what it looks like in the city of La Paz, what traditional medicine looks like. Um, as part of that, we're asking healers to provide us with the location where they work, where they live, and the sacred sites that they visit. So as Dr. Kispe mentioned, um, you have healers that travel. Uh, Kayawayas, is, it's a tradition that isn't stationary. And this was one of the biggest problems in bringing traditional healers into hospitals, is that they didn't see the healing practice as stationary. They would move between their own communities to sacred sites, finding those who are sick. So uh, in the cities these days, you've seen kind of an influx of these traditional medicine centers. So all of the blue dots there represent where traditional practitioners work. Um, the pink dots represent where traditional practitioners live, and the green are sacred sites. So there's kind of a hub, a center of traditional medicine in La Paz, and there are probably more of them. So we've done about 25 of these, and during the inauguration of the center, 
We're going to register as many as we can. And there's estimates that there's about 250 practicing traditional healers in the city of La Paz. So hopefully this will expand. And um, not exactly sure what the map will show us yet, but for one thing, it will show kind of this triangular nature of healing in cities where you have a place of providing to patients, a place of commerce, a place where you have your community, where people know to come to you, um, and then these sacred sites that exist all over the country, really. So hopefully something really interesting does come out of the mapping. So to finish up, Ecuador and future directions. Um, in Bolivia, still, we're hoping to do another in-depth survey in hospitals. I uh, ran into some snags trying to get that worked out, but quantitative data goes a really far way among biomedical practitioners. They love the numbers. So if we can get some good numbers that show them that people are using traditional medicine, it could be really powerful, potentially more powerful than the interview study. So hoping to move that forward. Um, and then what's so great is we just had a wonderful talk on education about traditional medicine. And that is really key in moving towards intercultural health. So uh, with the delegation, we're hoping to try to organize and present some ideas for courses or curriculum for medical students so that they can become aware of traditional medicine, how it's being practiced, and some tenets of cultural competence to communicate with their patients. And moving into Ecuador, um, I just arrived trying to plant myself and figure out what exactly will happen there. But um, I plan to recreate the survey, uh, the interview study rather, in a hospital that has a similar patient population, which is Hospital del Sur Enrique Garces. So hopefully I can do the same types of interviews there and see what is different, what is the same in Ecuador uh, compared to Bolivia. And then there's hopefully an incredible opportunity at the Jami Wasi Intercultural Hospital to see how a place that integrates biomedicine and traditional medicine is solving some of these problems that are coming out of the other interviews. So hopefully I'll be able to do some interviews with patients there. Um, and the Jambi Wasi Hospital is in Otavalo, uh, Ecuador, and is referred to as an urban hospital. Um, not quite as urban as a city as La Paz or Quito, but um, it's pretty much the best example of intercultural health in an urban environment. So hopefully it reveals some interesting new discoveries. So that is about it. And uh, thank you. If you have any questions. Great. And if you have any advice, I'm still doing research. So please feel free to contact me. Advice, contacts, anything helps. Thank you, Chris. I just want to point out that uh, Chris said that uh, he was working with the delegation um, in Bolivia. I was actually met with the head of the delegation, your former student in Bolivia, a couple of weeks ago. And uh, Marcelo told me that Chris had basically become a member of the delegation and that this work was going to be critical to the, um, to the work that they were doing in the future. So I think it's a great example of, of how sort of quantitative perspective can actually play an important role in a very ancient way of thinking. And speaking of older ways of thinking, uh, we've talked a lot here. Yes, there you are, the historian. In <laughs> um, we've talked a lot about education, about apprenticeship, about the various cultural issues and intercultural issues. And I, I think it's also important to realize that these ideas, these themes, these conversations are not necessarily new. They're conversations and negotiations that have taken place for quite a while. And with that in mind, um, it's my pleasure to introduce Farron Yero, who is in our own Duke Department of History, uh, finishing up your dissertation, right? First year. First year of your dissertation. Ah, it's almost over in that case. <laughs> anyway, she'll be speaking about uh, Correnderos and the Botanical Reconquista, Ritual Healing and Enlightened Eating in 18th Century New Spain. Please. My paper is going to be very different. Um, yes. Um, so I just wanted to say a few words about the paper before I get started. Um, like I said, it's part of a new project. I'm just beginning my dissertation research this year. Um, and so the idea is to look more broadly at how power and knowledge are intersecting and are interacting as part of the Bourbon project in 18th century New Spain. And so specifically, what I'm hoping to explore is how notions of gender, race, and sexuality 
are intersecting with these ideas about disease, food, and the human body in medicine and in healing practices throughout the 18th century. So within the paper, I've developed four different sections. Um, the first one, I'll provide a brief background on the Bourbon reforms as they relate to the fields of medicine and botany. And then next, I'll look at Nawa physiology and the tenets of Galenic medicine and Spanish ideas about bodily humors, which was um, essentially the main idea about medical theory at the time, um, and how these epistemologies of healing interacted in New Spain. And then the third section, we'll look at cases of healing, um, focusing on how food operated within ritual practice. And then finally, I'm going to offer some thoughts, um, some concluding thoughts on method. Okay. So in the northern... In the northern mining town of Zacatecas, there was an indigenous healer known as Roque de los Santos. In 1733, Roque was accused in front of the Holy Office of the Inquisition as a quack and a superstitious curandero. Roque admitted that he did in fact belong to a family of healers and that he had learned his practice from his mother. However, he also told his inquisitors that he had apprenticed himself under Francisco Lopez, a man known to be an established indigenous healer. The Inquisition, an institution that served to root out heresy and reinforce religious orthodoxy, was interested in Roque not only because of his alleged superstitious practice, but also for his purported medical fraudulency. It's interesting then that Roque defended himself by assuring his inquisitors that in addition, or perhaps in spite of his familial connections, he had received medical training through a recognized form of instruction. These charges against Roque in his own defense raise a number of questions about the production and transmittal of medical knowledge at this time, Spanish attitudes towards curandermismo, sorry, very dry mouth, and more importantly, how individual curanderos' conceptualizations, conceptualizations of their own practice um, as Enlightenment notions of medicine, health, and botany came to be institutionalized in 18th century New Spain. So curanderos understood sickness to be more than a corporeal ailment, and thus their treatment went beyond the physical. The human body, the natural environment, and the spiritual realm were directly linked through the consumption of food and botanicals. The professionalization of medical healing and the growing field of botanical science challenged this interaction. We can rely then on the preeminence of botanicals as sites of analysis as one way of examining the ways in which professional medicine influenced curandero healing practices, but also the way that curandero knowledge might have contributed to or challenged professional knowledge. In the last decade, historians of Latin America have become increasingly interested in Enlightenment thought and its influence on various scientific communities throughout Spanish America. These studies have rightly challenged the black legend belief that Spain and its kingdoms, in their religious fervor, were backwards and superstitious, challenging binaries that pitted modernity against tradition. Many of these studies demonstrate how the Spanish defended themselves against the critiques of French and English writers and scientists, yet they rarely ask how Curandero saw themselves in this changing world. We see that despite regulations and repression from the colonial state, the church, and the Proto Medicaro, which is like the Royal Board of Medicine, healers continued their work. Scholars interested in the early years of conquest and colonization have asked questions regarding the social and cultural implications of these practices. We see that ideas about healing, cosmologies, and physiologies were exchanged by both curanderos and trained physicians during these periods. We can look to these works to develop new questions about ritual healing, especially where it utilizes food and herbs for the 18th century. So after King Charles III's ascension in 1759, his government established a set of new policies known as the Bourbon Reforms, in the hope of strengthening the Spanish crown and its control over its imperial kingdoms. The crown was interested in improving administrative bureaucracy, strengthening military defenses, optimizing trade, and rethinking natural resource extraction. Between 1759 and Napoleon's invasion in 1808, almost 60 scientific expeditions were launched throughout the empire. These projects were part of a larger program that include exploring unknown frontiers, charting coastlines, producing maps, conducting astronomical observations, and pro uh, producing botanical guides and natural histories. So botanical travelers were instructed to survey the flora of the Spanish Indies, explore its economic potential, and gather collections from Madrid's Royal Botanical Garden and Royal Natural History Cabinet. By 1788, one out of five of the botanical specimens in the Royal Garden came from the New World. Art historian Daniela Blakemar has referred to these expeditions as part of the Botanical Reconquista, the attempt to recolonize and regain tight control over Spanish America. Creole naturalists born in New Spain were initially excited to participate in the scientific dialogue. However, in time, tensions rose up between imperial and local agendas. As Spanish Creole intellectuals made claims for their right to lead botanical research in New Spain, 
He adopted a proprietary attitudes toward New World botanicals, championing local cultural forms of knowledge, um, most notably by way of language. Among the many transatlantic conflicts, one of the most interesting is that between opposing approaches to the taxonomy and naming of New World natural specimens. When the Spanish first arrived on the Mexican coast, they began learning the names and uses of medicinal plants in Nahuatl, the most widely spoken indigenous language in the valley of central Mexico. Creole intellectuals claim these Nahuatl names and their link to a glorified past, even as they look down on contemporary curandero practices. They critique the Linnaean botanical schema for its basis in morphology rather than on the plant's functional properties, arguing that taxonomy that privileged external features over local knowledge about its uses created artificial relationships and that furthermore, it proffered a globalizing, decontextualizing approach that erased local expertise. From the time of the Orinoco expedition in 1752, the Spanish crown imposed the Linnaean system on all botanical institutions. The imperial nature of this taxonomy was not lost on the crown, nor on Spanish naturalists. In imposing this nomenclature, Spanish naturalists displaced the local and traditional knowledge that was expressed in Nahuatl. In 1788, Vicente Cervantes, a pro linnaean naturalist and the then director of the Mexican Botanical Garden, argued that Nahuatl was unintelligible, garbled, and, quote, to be spoken in public places and small groups with Indian women selling herbs and vegetables, but not in the academies of the learned, unquote. His work on the Spanish, um, or the Hispanic Enlightenment, um, in his work on this, uh, Jorge Canizares Esquera shed some light on this attitude arguing that many European thinkers at the time, including Abbe Renal, considered the Spanish to be overly religious brutes, and worse yet, poor witnesses. He argued that had the French or the English been the first to discover Tenochtitlan, we would have had a much more objective account of the New World. Creole naturalists and physicians tried to distance themselves from popular spiritual healers, trying to emulate the objective and rational approaches preferred by European Enlightenment thinkers. The, Nau the Nahuatl nomenclature that Creole scientists wished to maintain expressed meanings and uses that linked the physical and the spiritual. However, the divine properties of plants were erased as Creole intellectuals shared their knowledge with the broader scientific community. In choosing to transmit and commodify certain forms of knowledge, other forms were silenced. Early modern discourses about human difference emphasized the mutable nature of the human body, and diet played a key role in this transformative process. Concerned for their health in the tropics, Spanish colonizers anxiously sought out the importation of European foods, which they believed would protect them in alien climes. These ideas were based upon the tenets of Galenic medicine, which understood all bodies to consist of a balance of four humors. Each individual had a particular humoral balance, always in an uneasy equilibrium, which was subject to a number of external forces, including food. Imbalance could induce serious agitations in both physical and emotional conditions. Rebecca Earle argues that the Spanish understood diet to be the primary differentiating factor between civilization and barbarism. It was generally understood that humorally, Spaniards were choleric and aggressive, whereas Indians were considered phlegmatic. Bartolomé de las Casas, colonist turned Dominican friar, explained that this difference was simply due to the fact that Spaniards and Indians ate different foods. While Europeans were nourished on wine and wheat bread, Indians ate, quote, roots and herbs and things from the earth and fish, unquote. He understood that this cold food generated the abundance of cold humors that characterized what he called the indigenous body and its docile nature. Although curanderos certainly did not believe that their bodies were naturally conducive for colonization, humoral medicine did share many similarities with Nawaf thought regarding the human body. Although individual healers must have held slightly different ideas about health and epidemiology, they would have shared a fundamental understanding about the way the body was animated and its link to the spiritual world. Nawa physiology emphasized three primary animistic centers, the head, the heart, and the liver, which regulated the life forces that flowed between different bodies, deities, and the physical world. One anima, tonal, was understood to be a radiating heat, which emanated from the body. Much like the cold, hot polarity of humoralism, tonal needed to be regulated. Too much or too little heat could lead to an illness and possibly even death. Earl argues that Spaniards understood that, quote, life itself, sustained by the natural heat and radical moisture characteristic of a healthy body, was indeed entirely dependent on food, more than any substance or activity that helped maintain the body's warmth and moisture, unquote. Daily interactions, as well as major life events, constantly threatens the body's equilibrium. Curanderos were relied upon to bring the body and society back into balance. The other primary anima was known as teolia, the life force that could transmit energy beyond death which was contained by the heart. In the 16th century, missionaries sought out ideas with Nawa, within Nawa cosmology that might function as surrogates for Christian concepts, and they quickly adopted Teolia to talk about the soul. 
Souls could be stolen or given away, just as Teolia could be pulled from one's body. Although not considered healers in the traditional sense, men and women, uh, men and women known as alusos or alumbrados, were able to retrieve these forces, often with the ritual use of food. Nora Jaffrey argues that although visionaries were not specifically engaged in healing, their practices incorporated elements of curandero spirit possession. She argues that the most frequent supernatural phenomenon experienced in the 17th century were visions of other people's souls and the subsequent miracle, work, miracle working to remove them from purgatory. Visionaries would often use substances such as chocolate, tobacco, and peyote to cure their clients, and when possessed by otherworldly spirits would actually demand to be fed these substances. As art historian um, and historian Joan Bristol observes in her work on 17th century ritual practices, healers made use of cures to heal the body as well as relationships, whether they were romantic affairs or disputes with authority figures. Healers made use of a number of materials to work their practice, and their efficacy lay in their preparation and handling through ritual. Although several foodstuffs were obviously used in these rituals, I'm going to start by examining the consumption of insects and amphibians. Um, Spaniards were content to eat chocolate and chili peppers. Um, however, they weren't so sure about toads and insects. In Europe, these creatures were associated with unfoods, critters associated with plagues and only to be in times of crisis, and they're often associated with the apocalypse. Curandero use of these insects, amphibians and reptiles, and rituals and divination ceremonies made these foods appear unchristian as well as uncivilized. And the consumption of these foods after the taking of communion was considered particularly heinous, especially if the food was eaten raw. What's really interesting is um, eating raw insects, um, and for some reason ticks show up a lot in the records, uh, was considered a sin that actually had to be confessed. Um, and as Claude Levi Strauss has argued, raw food was considered a powerful marker of barbarous nature untransformed by human culture. And similarly, the Spaniards thought the ability to determine the edible from the inedible was an important indicator of civility. So it's interesting to think about how these insects were used in these ceremonies um, given their association with what's called plazoli. And this is often translated as trash, um, but it can also be understood as a byproduct and source of sexuality. So Tlazoli fell under the purview of the goddess Tlazolteot, who, along with other fertility goddesses, was understood to control the processes of cleansing, which is done in a Temescal, which we saw earlier. Um, we see these insects as accoutrements of Tlazolteot in the pictorial manuscripts, um, notably the Codex Borbonicus, where she's displayed alongside a centipede, a snake, and a spider. So in Nawathat, sex had the ability to maintain life or destroy it. Thus, an overabundance of sexual energy in a human body was considered dangerous, but it could be controlled through the intervention of curanderos. In one example, Pete Siegel recalls the story of Chochiquetzal and the scorpion. So when a scorpion stung an individual, he could turn to the curandero, who would then recount the following story. It was said that a man went up into the mountains to fast and refrain from sexual activity, knowing that if he succeeded, the gods would provide him with the power to kill his enemies. However, he was unable to maintain his vows and was seduced by the goddess Chochiquetzal. He was thus beheaded and transformed into a scorpion. So after telling the story, the curandero would coax the poison out of his client's body by simulating sex, taking on the role of Chochiquetzal herself. And so then the curandero, possessed by the goddess, would remind the scorpion that because he failed to, take his, um, to keep his vow before, he couldn't kill his victim now. Um, and Siegel argues that this story, one related by a Nahua parishioner to a Catholic priest, reflects the persistence of this indigenous story and this knowledge over, over the 16th and 17th centuries. So another site of contestation within colonial healing practices was the realm of women's medicine. Contraception and abortions in particular were important services provided by curanderos. Pregnant women from elite circles could easily diffuse perceived dishonor through an existing infrastructure maintained to shield well, uh, women from the public until they gave birth. At that point, the child was either sent to an orphanage or sent to a distant relative. However, most women in New Spain couldn't turn to such a system. And instead, they would turn to pre-Columbian forms of women's medicine, including abortion. And so the church and the colonial state considered it to be a criminal offense. And if convicted, both the mother and her accomplices were sentenced to death. Um, there's a midwifery manual from 1775 that warns, quote, midwives and any other person who counsel or cooperate in any way with abortion sin mortally even if the creature is not animated, and even when they do this to protect the honor or life of the pregnant woman. And if the creature is animated, they incur excommunication and will receive the death penalty for this act. So despite these threats, surprisingly few women were actually prosecuted, um, either for abortion or what was considered a related crime of infanticide. 
So uh, Nora Jaffrey argues that colonial judicators were hesitant to carry out these harsh punishments and because of their leniency actually managed to condone the practice. And so the pervasiveness of this practice raises questions about the circulation of knowledge about abortifacients um, or botanicals that would induce a miscarriage or an abortion. Um, so Jeffrey recalls a medical tract from 1795 where um, writer Antonio Leon Igama, who was one of New Spain's most celebrated uh, scientists, remarked that, quote, all the uterine illnesses that women suffer from find sufficient remedy in the multitude of herbs known by the generic name of Siwapathli, or medicine of women in Nahuatl, unquote. Many of these plants continue to be used for menstrual problems, but also to help facilitate births. Most curanderos who would also offer their service as midwives knew that these plants could be used to induce miscarriages. Naturalists working in New Spain included abortifacients in their collections for the botanical gardens in Mexico City and Madrid. However, this particular use was not always reported. And the silencing of this type of knowledge isn't you know, that um, unreasonable given the taboo against contraception and abortion. Um, but it's just an other example of this kind of selective knowledge that the naturalists offering uh, to a European audience uh, suggests one more way in which traditional knowledge was being suppressed. And so there's been a growing body of scholarship that's addressing globalization in the early modern world through the lens of botanical and medical knowledge circulation. And again, very few of these studies are considering the role of, role of healers as producers of knowledge. And as we glean from Roque de los Santos in the Inquisition file earlier, Curanderos could learn their trade from their families, but um, others felt uh, the call of their Nahuatl, which is an animal spirit that kind of guides over one from birth. Um, and so this, this kind of begs the question, how did these initiations change? Because, or if they did, um, through the professionalization of medicine. And did Curanderos seek medical licenses in addition to traditional education? And how did these healers understand the plants they were working with at the time, and also, um, you know, how they got access to them given the same time Bourbon reforms are creating this, these massive campaigns for modernization, so mining um, and livestock. Um, so all these kind of agricultural revolutions are going on at the time and it's interesting to think then about what was brought up earlier about the environmental question of how access to these plants is, is changing. Um, so these questions in this kind of work um, raise a number of theoretical and methodological issues. So how do we actually go about understanding the cultural meanings and the worldviews that curanderos constituted through their work? Their stories are told almost exclusively through an archive that emphasizes the scandalous, the strange, and the criminal, that is, records of inquisition and criminal court trials. How do we go about representing healing practices without echoing the narrative of the colonial state? And how do we accommodate different historical perspectives and represent the epistememes that curanderos worked within? And how do we go about doing this when the categories for examining the colonial world remain predominantly European? James Sweet takes on these issues in his work with the Inquisition file of Domingo Salvarez, an enslaved African healer who traversed the Portuguese empire. Building on the theoretical insights of Stephen Fireman, Sweet's work is a critique of Atlantic histories, especially those of the Black Atlantic, that do not actually incorporate African historical perspectives. This type of work does little to reveal how African institutions and ideas impacted the Americas. Instead, quote, the erasure of African categories of knowledge reduces the history of the Atlantic to a European-American anachronism, assuming the only black Atlantic history worth telling is one in which African aspirations are expressed through colonial American languages and institutions, unquote. Sweet's critique of Atlantic history can be applied to Nahua epistemologies as well. If we are to attempt to understand the way that curanderos thought about their practice and its broader social and political implications, then we need to rely on different categories of analysis and move beyond just the institutional discourses that colonial or state archives produced. Sweet argues that beyond physically healing, Domingos performed wider, much more crucial social and political roles in society. His primary function was that of an intellectual, a function that was, quote, directive, organizational, or educative, unquote. And that's from Stephen Fireman. And his position amongst different social relations allowed him to extract broader political meanings from illness. Throughout the Atlantic world, Dominguez offered this political discourse of health and healing as an alternative to imperialist discourses engaging in a critique of the most important political issues of his day. Curanderos were intellectuals in their own right, producing medical and botanical knowledge of which Creoles and Europeans made great use. However, we still know very little about what Curanderos did with this knowledge beyond physical healing. Michael Taussig reminds us that Curanderos in the Putumaya River Basin, well into the 20th century, understood healing as a critique of capitalism and a way of curing the consequential social ills and terror that the rubber boom economy aspired in the region. 
As researchers continue to explore questions of global networks and biomedicine, we should insist on questioning the silences imposed in the name of science and modernity, continue to rethink the language we use to conceptualize epistemologies that are not our own, and seek out the different meanings that botanical knowledge and healing practices could have had.